if you Google committing murder with your mind, <laughs> like I did recently, you'll get a lot of Bible verses and internet wisdom about the teachings of Jesus. Not what I'm looking for. What I need is an inverse dictionary. I have a definition that needs a term. What is it called when you commit murder using only your mind? I ask chat GPT, it spits out psychic assassination. That's pretty good. But I prefer a phrase an old friend of mine coined once, mental murder. <laughs> I know about mental murder. I was 15 years old and I was a poetry nerd. I was enthralled by Ginsburg, Ferlin Getty, and E.E. E. Cummings. I'd sink into a beanbag chair in the library after school and share poems with friends. I could recite Shakespeare without fear and with some idea about what I was saying. I filled countless marble notebooks with my own verses, playing fast and loose with form, capitalization, and punctuation. Words and all the surprising ways in which they come together delighted me. It was a magical romance, language and me. Then I hit 10th grade. I paraded into the first class of my favorite subject, English, where I encountered my nemesis for the first time, Mr. Maloney. A tall man, wire-rimmed glasses, suspenders. He might have been lanky once, but no longer. Hair that might have been blonde once, meticulously combed over his shiny bald head. He probably had a first name, Neil or Jim, maybe. I already knew Mr. Maloney, Maloney by reputation, not from my classmates, though, no. I had heard about him because he had been my mother's homeroom teacher 30 years earlier. At some point in the 1960s, he shamed my mother for wearing a mini skirt. Now here I was in the same school, maybe in the same classroom, facing the same man. And I would be part of his very last class because he was retiring at the end of the school year. Lucky me. <laughs> Mr. Maloney had one mission and one mission only, to teach us kids proper grammar. Any affection we had for poetry, literature, or letters was mere frivolity. The creative impulse, nothing but a roadblock. Mr. Maloney would be happy to take the wonder of E.E. E. Cummings' shimmering linguistic puzzles and reformulate them into well-structured paragraphs. <laughs> it was his... It was his last year in the classroom and he did not have a fuck left to give. <laughs> I longed to join the honors English class. I sat for the test to get into that class once, twice. No one told me why I had been rejected or how I had failed. I just wasn't honors material, I figured. Over in honors English, they were reading long novels written by dead British people and dead Russians. <laughs> we were reading garbage, American garbage. <laughs> Flimsy novels so forgettable I've forgotten them all. All I remember is a book about contemporary American teenagers that featured a fairly graphic sexual encounter. As we read the book aloud in class, all of us quiet and disengaged, we finally reached the horny part. Mr. Maloney was curt. He said, I think we'll skip this part, shall we? As if he was shaming the very book he was teaching. We jumped ahead a page or two. In our sad class discussions, we never mentioned the unmentionable pages. Mr. Maloney had no tolerance for spicy content which was odd because the books he assigned all contained spicy content. The only thing we read all year that made an impression on me was Paul's Case, a short story by Willa Cather about a gay teenage runaway. It's a beautiful, terribly sad story. When we discussed it in class, Mr. Maloney 
never mentioned that Paul was gay. It was subtextual, but well-established and certainly obvious to me at the tender age of 16. But for this class, unmentionable. Once, we were allowed to indulge in a creative writing project. I don't remember what I wrote, but I wrote my short story with joy and gusto. I took it seriously. I wrote like a champ. Maloney's feedback addressed only my incorrect punctuation. He had no interest in my imaginative powers. Perhaps the creative impulses of teenage minds made him uncomfortable. Or, again, maybe he just didn't give a fuck. Halfway through the year, for the third time, I sat for the test to get me out of that class and into honors English. For the third time, I was rejected without explanation. Guess who was scoring the test? So I sat at my desk every day, quietly seething. While I was supposed to be taking notes on whatever, I filled my English notebook with rage poetry. <laughs> Sadly, this notebook is lost to time, but the tone of the work was probably similar to the rage poetry in this computer printout of one of my poems from 1996. <laughs> However, the rage poetry in my English notebook was a little bit different. It was directed squarely at Maloney. I remember pressing the blue ballpoint pen deep into the lined paper, silently glaring at Maloney, the words pouring out in all caps. My howling soul was in hell and Maloney was the devil. <laughs> Spring came. Before the school year ended, I sat for the honors English test for the fourth time. Soon after, I was accepted by lottery into the 11th grade American Studies program, a class that combined US history and literature in which any student was welcome to, create the to complete the additional honors English assignments. I couldn't wait. On one of the very last days of the school year, Mr. Maloney sought me out during lunch as informal as you please, disturbing my peace. Mm -hmm. Handelsman, it was the first and only time he ever spoke to me directly. Handelsman, you can take honors English next year if you want. My blood turned to bile. Rage shot through my eyes again. I snapped, I got into American studies, so yes, I will be taking honors English next year. I turned on my heels as he responded with something that sounded like, oh, I loved American studies. Hurston, Faulkner, all the authors who are probably banned now. <laughs> One evening during my senior year, while I was happily composing an essay for my AP English class, attempting to prove that Gogo and Didi's troubles in waiting for Godot were all the fault of that young messenger boy, <laughs> my mom, brought my attention to an item in our little local newspaper. Normally our town paper didn't have much to report. High school football team defeated by other high school football team. <laughs> Woman hears strange noises in her backyard. Police discover raccoons. <laughs> but this was different, an obituary. One year after his retirement, Mr. Maloney had died. He was only in his 60s. A chill went through me. Oh God, I thought. I did it. <laughs> I killed Mr. Maloney. I killed him with my mind. <laughs> it was the rage poetry, no question. My jagged lines cast an evil spell. The lightning from my eyeballs through a hex poisoned his heart until he could bear it no longer. I took down the tall, balding man. I had no idea I was so powerful or that my powers could be used for such a purpose. I was untrained in the dark arts. I realized I had to be careful. I did not know my own strength. As these thoughts raced through my brain, I glanced at the photo that accompanied the obituary. There was Mr. Maloney riding a camel? Next to him was another man about the same age and type atop another camel.
Both men were smiling, ear to ear, easy smiles. It was a photo from Mr. Maloney's retirement. He was traveling the world. According to the caption, the other unnamed man in the photo was his traveling companion. My heart sunk. I could read the subtext. <laughs> what had I done? Had I misjudged this man? Had I spent that school year in the splash zone of his trauma? Had he spent decades living in the shadows of the safety and quiet of a closed-minded community, slaving away under the public school fluorescent lights, struggling to teach suburban dirtbags to have some command of the English language? Had he denied himself all those years the kind of romance and adventure he dreamed of, saving it for retirement, only to be cut short in what turned out to be his prime? by the wicked thoughts of one of those very dirtbags he had dedicated his boring career to teaching? Now that he could finally be free from us, free to be himself, to live the life he had always hoped for, I had destroyed him. <laughs> I was a monster. I don't know what I said to my mother. I'm sure I produced some nonchalant grunt that signified adolescent indifference, but I was faking it. I swallowed my shame. I never atoned. I never spoke of Mr. Maloney again. Until now. <laughs> so tonight, I come bearing proof that there is some small degree of cosmic retribution in the universe. I stand before you a high school and middle school theater teacher. I'm no Maloney acolyte. I invite kids to run around and play games and tap into their creative voices. But my favorite thing to teach in the world is punctuation. <laughs> there <laughs> is nothing more beautiful than, than following the map of well-placed commas, dashes, and gorgeous ellipses through a forest of words. I teach young actors to read a character's secret thoughts, their subtext in the playwright's punctuation. I had slideshows dedicated to the matter. Where did this punctuation obsession probably start? <laughs> read my subtext. Now, I know what you're probably wondering. Did I ever kill again? <laughs> well, there was this one former boss who, during the few short months that I worked for her, put me into such a state of heightened anxiety that I literally got shingles. <laughs> I was in my mid-20s at the time. When my doctor examined me, she said, this looks like shingles, but that's unusual in someone your age. And then she looked into my eyes and asked, are you under a lot of stress? <laughs> I burst into tears on the exam table. Anyway, many years later, after this boss laid me off, along with her entire small staff, I found myself Googling something and came across an obituary. <laughs> 